Insightful podcasts by informative hosts. Insights into Things, a podcast network. Welcome to Insights into Entertainment, a podcast series taking a deeper look into entertainment and media. Your hosts, Joseph and Michelle Whalen, a husband and wife team of pop culture fanatics, are exploring all things from music and movies to television and fandom. Welcome to Insights in Entertainment. This is episode 83, Tributes, Lawsuits, and Emmys. Oh my! I'm your host, Joseph Whalen, and my talented and beautiful co-host, Michelle Whalen. Aww. How you doing today, dear? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing good on the second start here. We kind of had a false start <laughs> with the first stream here. Yeah. In my defense, I just do want to point out that uh, there's a lot of moving parts to this podcast. And uh, should I forget to do everything in the order I'm supposed to do it, we tend to have technical difficulties. Yeah, it's okay. So, in today's episode, in our Disney Detective, we'll talk about a mural that's unveiled in downtown Disney, which is a tribute to uh, a fallen hero, shall we say. We'll talk about poor Duke Kaboom, who's being sued for appearing to be someone else. Uh, and we have a new dancing audio animatronic. <clears throat> Want to get one for the house? That would be awesome. That would be kind of cool. Then in our tales from the edge of the galaxy, <clears throat> is he in or is he out? Hmm. We'll, we'll leave that one hanging there. For our entertainment news, we'll talk about the Nick Fury show. Sounds like a talk show. <laughs> da, 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 da. <laughs> Nick Fury's getting his own variety, variety show. show. Yeah, <laughs> now, that, now that would be funny. That would be funny. <laughs> uh, and we'll have a real quick Emmy recap of the best and the worst of the Emmys. And then we'll finish up with our insightful picks of the week. Are we ready to get started? Sure. All right, let's do it. Before we start, though, because I missed this part in the script... <laughs> I thought maybe you were just totally going no, no. over it. Before so, we start, okay. I do want to encourage folks to subscribe to the podcast on any of your podcast affiliate networks out there, Apple, Spotify, Google, et cetera, et cetera. And we also invite you to reach out to us and give us your feedback. You can get all of our uh, social media links on our website at insightsintothings.com or you can email us at comments at insightsintothings.com. Good enough? Good enough. Go for Disney Detective. So Downtown Disney unveiled a beautiful mural of Chadwick Boseman. It was a powerful mural of the late Chadwick Boseman. Uh, it was actually revealed uh, this past Thursday. It was created um, by author and artist Nicholas Smith, and the image is of Boseman uh, exchanging the Wakanda salute with a child who is wearing a Black Panther mask. Um, he had said, this one is special. My King Chad tribute is now on a wall, uh, is now on a wall on display at downtown Disney. He actually had posted this on his, uh, Instagram. He said, it is a full circle moment for me. My final two projects as a Disney Imagineer last summer were working on the Children's Hospital Project and the Avengers Campus. Uh, to millions of kids, T'Challa was a legend larger than life, and there were no more worthy, and, and no one was more worthy to fill those shoes than Chadwick Boseman. He uh, continued, I'm so thankful to be honored, to be able to honor Chadwick's life and purpose in this way, and I am grateful to the Disney family for being so supportive of my journey as an artist. Um, so, Obviously, Disneyland is still closed right now, but the shopping area is opened uh, in in Anaheim, the downtown Disney area. And this was, like I said, unveiled uh, just 
a couple of days ago. Nice. So a nice little tribute. Now, was this a tribute or had this been something that had been planned uh, all along? I don't think this was planned. At, I think this was just a so very this was, recent. This was Disney going out of its way to mm-hmm. to make a tribute. to Right, them. right. That's very nice. Yeah. Very nice. Uh, tell us about uh, Duke Kaboom. <laughs> so Disney is actually being sued by Evil Knievel's estate over claims that it used the stunt performer's likeness in Toy Story 4. So released in 2019, the fourth installment of the Disney Pixar franchise featured a toy called Duke Kaboom, who was voiced by Keanu Reeves and who wore a white jumpsuit with red accents while performing tricks on his motorbike. Now, if you didn't see the movie, Duke Kaboom was Canadian. He had a big giant maple leaf on on the back of his, you know, outfit and I believe even on his his motorcycle. But anyway, um so the legal documents that were um that TMZ actually saw um showed that K&K Promotions uh, had filed a lawsuit against Disney and Pixar claiming that the character is a clear copy of Knievel. They allege that Disney did not seek permission to use his likeness, which they own, and that the character is a near replica of the original Evil Knievel toy from the 1970s, in which the stuntman is sat on a wind-up motorcycle. Knievel's son, Kelly, uh, said of the lawsuit, Evil Knievel did not thrill millions around the world, break his bones, or sp- spit his blood just so Disney could make a bunch of money. <laughs> Think he think he's a little mad. Um, he said he remains an instant an instantly recognized icon as demonstrated by the huge popularity of the reissue Evil Knievel stunt cycle among kids who hadn't even been born when my father died a dozen years ago. Uh, K and K also claims that Disney instructed the Toy Story four cast to avoid using Knievel's names during the interview. Um, in a, a statement that was shared, uh, the Walt Disney Company uh, had said, the claims are without merit and we intend to defend against them vigorously in court. Well, what I find interesting is they admit in this lawsuit that it is a near replica. Mm-hmm. So it's not a replica. Right. They also admit that Disney instructed all of the participants to not refer to evil can evil right. when they were interviewed. Mm-hmm. So it seems to me as though they took steps to ensure that they weren't illegally using the right. representation. Right. The fact that they slapped a, you know, Canadian maple leaf on the back of his suit kind of helps that out too. And and the fact that, you know, like part of his his backstory you know the his his owner you know his his boy was canadian jean pierre or mm-hmm. something you know along those lines and and that all of his statements and whatever about you know were very canadian right things. well and so the other it, thing is know. if you look back to the 60s and the 70s and you look at the stunt shows that mm-hmm. were popular right evil can evil didn't corner the market on being a motorcycle stunt driver. Right, right. So what Duke Kaboom represents is a conglomeration of all of those of that genre and that mm-hmm. time period. Right. So I'm 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 going to go out on a limb here and, and back Disney on this one and say that they did what they needed to do. Right. Or even the fact, you know, like you were saying, it was a, con- a conglomerate. How many toys are ripoffs of other toys? Right. You know, so like the Woody doll, you know, what is that really? Is that more of a howdy doody? Really, when you think about it, you know, who was the most popular cowboy in in the 50s? It was, you know, so, you know, it's not like it was the Cabbage Patch Kid or, you know, it was the knockoff version. Right. You know, because he failed. He couldn't, you know, anytime he tried to to do it, he always failed. Fail. Duke Boom always failed. So, well, can evil failed a lot. Too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you know the whole broken bones thing. So, well, and it, it's funny <clears throat> they mentioned that they re-released the evil can evil stunt cycle. 
Did right. they re-release that before or after Toy Story 4? Yeah, I don't I'm, know. I'm guessing I'm probably guessing after. They capitalized on Duke Kaboom yeah. in that movie so that they could re-release a toy that oh, no I'm sure. kid knows about today. Right. Which they admit. Right. So I don't think this one's going to go yeah. too far. Yeah. Anyway, lawsuits out of the way because, you know, it's really not a week of insights in entertainment if we're not suing <laughs> Disney for something. Right. Uh, tell us about our dancing audio animatronics. So this was really cool. So Walt Disney Imagineering um, was created back, you know, in the 1950s. And, you know, if you don't know much about the company or, or what they do. They're the ones that are responsible for all of the rides, all the ride technology, um, even the resorts and, and the things that go into it, you know, um, just it's amazing what they come up with. Um, but one of the things that they're so known for are their audio animatronics and the realistic looking figures, um, you know, and just the, you know, what they can do. Um, so, you know, one of the first audio animatronics full, you know, people, I guess you could say was, uh, Abraham Lincoln with moments, uh, with Lincoln. And we've talked about this <clears throat> before where, um, you know, they had issues where the, the fluid, you know, started leaking and the fluid happened to be red. So it looked like Lincoln got shot. And if you see, you know, video of these early animatronics, very stiff, but yet still kind of interesting, you know, the, the human aspect of it. Um, obviously a lot of the audio animatronics, it actually really started with the tiki birds. Um, and again, very simplistic. And over the years, they've gotten, um, better with their technology. So now, uh, there's a new, Beauty and the Beast attraction that opened at Tokyo Disneyland and it has a brand new audio animatronic and they are literally dancing. Um, Tokyo Disney is actually the one par Disney park that isn't owned entirely by Disney. It's actually operated by the Oriental Land Company, which licenses uh, the Disney IP from the company and contracts with um, Wed. Uh, industries, which is the Imagineering part, to help design the attractions. And the Oriental Land Company tends not to have the same financial restrictions that Disney itself has. So with two Disney resort parks, they actually have some of the more high tech rides uh, at their parks than any so, of the so other. Disney has financial restrictions? Really? Yeah, I they find do. that I find that hard to believe. Disney has more money than God. Yeah, well, not as much money. If if Disney has more money than God, Oriental Land Company is is above that. Interesting. Um, but what's interesting is that usually when a lot of the stuff comes, you know, opens in in Tokyo, because they've already established that ride technology, then it can kind of trickle down to some of. The other park. So that's where, like, Rise of the Resistance, the ride technology that they used for that was taken from rides that had already been established in, in Tokyo. Um, so unfortunately, the video, um, had gotten posted, but then had gotten taken down. But the person that had posted it on Twitter, it was still available. Do you have that? I'm not even going to play it because I don't want to risk getting taken down. <laughs> Well, if you if you look in our show notes and and look for it, um, it's really kind of cool to to watch. You know, it, it's Bell and and the Beast. You know, in a final scene, and and they're dancing, and you would you could swear that it was regular people. You know, oh, nice. dancing, not these not these audio animatronics. Um, so hopefully, now that the technology is out there usually again it can start trickling down to you know some of the other parks um now in california adventure uh the advent uh, avengers campus which was supposed to be opening up this past summer 
but due to obviously the park closing and, and whatnot, now there's a delay. There's supposed to be some really cool audio animatronic stunt characters um, that are part of that whole area. So, you know, it'll be interesting to see once that opens up, you know, what kind of technology they have for that. What would be really cool would be uh, a documentary on Disney Plus showing the creation of these because mm-hmm. we've watched the documentaries in the past. And mm-hmm. You kind of get to see the evolution of audio animatronics right. as you watch the documentaries mm-hmm. um, to the point where you even see where the jerkiness that you had mm-hmm. talked about before where right. they had wound up making changes to the pneumatics right, so that it looked, you know, it wasn't precise movements and stopping like, you know, human movements. You overshoot where your target is and you gently come back. Right. And they even started working that type of technology into the existing audio mm-hmm. animatronics. So it's always amazing to watch how they develop the technology for these things mm-hmm. and see, like, you know, you go to Hall of Presidents right. now mm-hmm. and, you know, Lincoln stands up from a chair. Right. And and gestures and, you right. know, it's. It's amazingly realistic. Right. And I remember back when Epcot opened and uh, the American Adventure and all of the different characters that they had in that. And the biggest thing was uh, Franklin walking up the stairs. Right. And that was you know, revolutionary because they never had a character. You know, the biggest thing was, you know, Abraham Lincoln standing up. That was, that was a big deal, you know, getting him to, to stand up in a a fluid movement. And then you had, um, you know, uh, Franklin walking up the stairs. And then the next kind of evolution was uh, the wicked witch from the great movie ride, she was like the third generation or fourth generation. I, I don't remember what their terminology was because, again, when she came up and started moving, yeah. she looked like a real person. And now you've gotten to the point where you have um, like the Johnny Depp uh, figures yeah. in in Pirates of the Caribbean, yeah. where people are like, "Are you are you sure yeah, that's not that, a that's you know? amazingly realistic look?" Yeah, and well, and then you've got who's what is it? It's uh, John in in. Uh, Carousel of Progress. Right. They were able to get him to break dance, so. <laughs> Purely by accident. So. That was totally by accident. <laughs> <laughs> so very cool. Hopefully we'll see some of this technology coming to a park near us. So. Mm-hmm. And I think that was all we had for our Disney detective this week. Mm-hmm. We'll be right back and we'll talk about our tales from the edge of the galaxy. <laughs> For seven years, the Second Sith Empire has been the premier community guild in the online game Star Wars The Old Republic. With hundreds of friendly and helpful active members, a weekly schedule of nightly events, annual guild meet and greets, and an active community both on the web and on Discord. The Second Sith Empire is more than your typical gaming group. We're family. Join us on the Star Forge server for nightly events such as operations, flashpoints, world boss hunts, Star Wars trivia, guild lottery, and much more. Visit us on the web today at www.thesecondsithempire.com. Go for Tales from the Edge of the Galaxy. So the other week we reported that Pedro Pascal was quitting. Well, now it seems early in the week he wasn't quitting. (laughs) And then later in the week it was like, well, he's really not in it as much anymore. So very confusing. Uh, You know, it's one of those it kind of changes minute by minute so last week obviously rumors um were circulating that pedro pascal was 
exiting the Mandalorian. Um, Insider Grace Randolph had shared that multiple sources had told her that the actor had proven difficult on the set and was demanding a chance to take his helmet off more in more scenes due to it being, you know, uncomfortable with the heavy uh, headgear and that producers weren't going to budge. And he basically was, you know, allegedly fired slash resigned after a pretty bad split midway through production. But then a new report came out that basically refutes all of those claims. Uh, tipster uh, Mikey Sutton of Geeksology uh, had shared that his own sources close to the production firmly denied that Pascal had left the show in any capacity and that these sources proved you know, uh, provided a, a couple of different reasons. Uh, for one, the actor would have been informed before signing on that his face would be covered up for virtually all of the, you know, the, um, uh, the production time, the, the show, the running time, which that was something that, you know, we had talked about. Um, so it's kind of unlikely that all of a sudden he would have had an issue with his character not having so much face time. Um, and that, um, that he also has, you know, the two different stunt coordinators who, who fill in for him. So if, you know, something was uncomfortable being on set, somebody else could have filled in for him. Um, so that was, you know, kind of the, the one thing was like, Hey, everything's fine. Everything's okay. And then a couple of days later, now another report comes out basically saying that he's refusing to return to the set of <laughs> the Mandalorian. So just when we thought everything seemed to be okay, now it seems that he's refusing to return. But again, you know, those are kind of um, being debunked as well, saying, well, he's not returning to the set. He's only returning as a voice only actor, um, because, again, he has the two guys that do the stunts. They could basically do all the filming and then he would just voice over. Um, but then what was really kind of, you know, funny was you had and we've talked about this person before uh the doomcock uh youtuber so he had a whole thing that came out that according to his sources pascal didn't quit but became very jealous of baby yoda that baby yoda was stealing all the spotlight and that he was forced to keep his face hidden under the helmet for the entire, you know, the majority of season one and season two. And as a result, his participation in season three and four will keep him restricted to the recording booth so that this way it keeps everybody happy. <laughs> Jealous of baby Yoda. <laughs> you know, it's all this is plausible. Mm hmm. It, it all obviously can't be true because there's so many conflicting stories. Right, right. What is clear is that something's going on. There's mm -hmm. some drama going on right. on the set that Disney is, sounds like it's trying to do its best to manage. Mm -hmm. And this is sort of like what we said when we talked about the issue originally, is that he's under contract. And... With a property that's this lucrative and with this much promise and this much future that they've already laid out. Right. They're not going to let him out of his contract. So they're going to do whatever they have to do to keep peace on the set and keep production going. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we had people in past articles that we covered talk about the fact that they don't need him in the suit. Right. And there's no point having him in the suit. Other than reactionary stuff on the set. But, you know, if all they need him to do is voice it over, that makes him expendable. Mm -hmm. Because you can easily find someone that can impersonate the voice. Right. Because it's not like his voice. Like, if you hear him speaking, it doesn't necessarily sound like him. He doesn't have. Because it's modulated coming through the helmet. Right. Too. So it's not like James Earl Jones. Like, right. when James Earl Jones 
speaks, you know it's him. When Pedro Pascal speaks as the Mandalorian, it's uh, Yeah, it's pretty generic. Right. So, yeah, you could technically find, you know, some someone else to, to play that part. Yeah. And, you know, it also speaks to the speculation that we had uh, earlier in the week that, you know, there are rumors that Boba Fett is supposed mm-hmm. to appear in season two. Boba Fett, there was, they were allegedly bringing back Tamora Morrison to play Boba Fett. So it's entirely possible that the Mandalorian is really just a generic part and it's played by different Mandalorians mm-hmm. as the torch is handed off. And you could very well see that torch handed off to Boba Fett, who's already a popular character. Right. And people are clamoring to get more of him. Yeah. And you could see... You know, Pedro Pascal's Mandalorian fall by the wayside when someone else steps in. Yeah. And you would think, knowing all this stuff, he'd be a little bit more accommodating. Right. Knowing that you're as expendable as you are. Mm-hmm, yeah. You know, maybe he doesn't want to be there anymore. Maybe maybe we pick up the torch with someone else. Mm-hmm. I hope it doesn't have a negative impact on the show. Because right. we lo- absolutely love the first mm-hmm. season. And it's got a lot of promise to it. And the new season is right around the corner, so. It is. And and there's mention from the other source here about a season four. I haven't heard anything about a season four being confirmed yet. Only right. season three. Right, right. So well, maybe there's a little more promise out there. Yeah, maybe. So that was all we had for our Hails from the Edge of the Galaxy. We'll be right back with our Entertainment News of the Week. <laughs> Insights into Teens, a podcast series exploring the issues and challenges of today's youth. Talking to real teens about real teen problems. Explore issues from braces to puberty, social anxiety to financial responsibility. Each week, we talk about the topics concerning today's youth. We look at how the issues affect teens, how to cope with these issues, and how parents, friends, and loved ones can help teens handle these challenges. Check out our video episodes on youtube.com backslash insights into things. Catch our audio versions on podcast.insightsintoteens.com on the web at insightsintothings.com. Tell us about Samuel L. Jackson getting his own variety show. (laughs) Now that would be funny. So Samuel L. Jackson is returning to the Marvel Cinematic Universe for a Nick Fury TV show on Disney Plus. Surprise, surprise. Uh, so the actor debuted in the MCU during the now famous uh, Iron Man post credit scene, becoming a franchise legend, really, um, throughout the whole entire uh, Infinity Saga. Um, Jackson um, reprised his role in a number a number of times over the past decade, becoming a fan favorite in the process. He appeared in all three uh, MCU movies uh, in nineteen uh, in two thousand nineteen, including a f- key supporting role in Captain Marvel that obviously gave details about his life before the Avengers uh, uh, initiative. Um, So audiences last saw Fury in Spider-Man Far From Home, where it was revealed that he had tasked uh, Talos uh, with impersonating him while he was taking a much needed break and relaxing um, on a Skrull spaceship. Uh, Since then, there's been little word of what Fury's future holds as the MCU prepares to enter phase four and beyond. Um, but the character is definitely going to be a major part of the franchise moving forward. And he's obviously the latest MCU figure to become the subject of a TV show. Um, so plot detail, the plot details are unknown as of right now. Um, but 
in this article, it talked about it that it wouldn't be surprised if it saw um, the Nick Fury show dealing with Sword in some capacity, and Swor- Sword was initially teased um, in Spider Man Far Far From Home. And that the organization will have a presence in WandaVision, which will be coming to Disney Plus uh, later this year. Uh, Fury being a part of S.W.O.R.D. reads as a natural progression for his character, particularly following the events of Infinity War uh, and Endgame. Um, so, obviously, we have WandaVision, which is... Um, going to be coming this year and then you also have falcon and winter soldier which i believe they've now pushed to next year you have loki now we're hearing more news with she hulk with different casting on that and now might as well get a uh a nick fury show to to add into the mix so disney plus is really becoming like marvel mcu you know offshoot yeah and this is actually kind of Oh, disturbing, I think. I think they're gonna okay. they're they're risking diluting the entire brand at this mm. point in time. And it's funny, I read an article this week uh where they had interviewed Kevin Feige, who mm-hmm. runs the MCU, and he took exception to Agents of Shield, the television show on ABC, playing in the MCU, which is why this last season of Agents of Shield had their alternate universe. Okay. So they were able to pull them out. Well, the last two seasons, really. Right. They were able to pull them out of the MCU. That's why you didn't see any crossover. Okay. So the fact that you're going to then take your characters from your MCU. Right. And create literally a show for each of them. Mm Mm-hmm. I think is probably going to be a little too much. Mm. I could certainly see... One or two shows coming out of there right. with the characters crossing over. Mm-hmm. Okay. That would work. But when you're getting to the point that you're giving everyone and their brother. <laughs> right. Is Maria Hill now going to get her own show? Right, right. Who's left? Who doesn't right. have a show? Who doesn't have a show yet that needs a show? Right. Me, me. Yeah. Now, my question is, is this because there's that much story to tell? In the MCU with these characters as you move to phase four and you're bringing different characters to the movies? Or is it that Disney Plus is desperate for new content to put up there that could and be they too. can't rely on their back catalog to keep subscriptions going? Mm. If that's the case, then you're making a mistake because now you really are diluting your product. Mm-hmm. And they tried to do the same thing with the Star Wars movies where it didn't work with Star Wars. It works with the MCU. Right, right. Um, The advantage that you do have with the MCU is in the comic book world, they've rebooted these characters numerous times because you have to put a comic book out on a regular schedule. Right, right. So that's a little bit more in tune with this type of dilution, Mm -hmm. but... I don't know. Like you still have very strong characters that you're you're going to have to delve into a level that's probably deeper than some of the fans are going to want to see. Mm. And, you know, it's, I go back to the the solo movie, right? You know, nobody needed the backstory for Han Solo. Everyone knew what it was. You knew enough about Han Solo that you didn't need a backstory. So what'd they do? They came out with a movie to give you a backstory, and they killed the character. Right, right. You didn't need a backstory for Darth Vader. Everyone knew who Darth Vader was. You got prequels, and you killed the character of Anakin Skywalker. He's, he, you know, he's a whiny teenager. They did the same thing with Boba Fett. You know, you see Boba Fett appear in, in Clone Wars, and then or Attack of the Clones, and then they carry through, and he's a whiny little kid in Clone Wars. So. Like, you have these characters that you put out on the stage that have this this aura about them, and there's an assumed background to them. You don't need to see that background. When you could put Darth Vader in that opening scene of A New Hope and make him the number one villain in the first 30 seconds of a movie or first three minutes of a movie, there's no need for a background. But what you're dealing with with the MCU is all these characters have some kind of established background because Mm -hmm. they've been in comics for so long. Right. So that's where it kind of works. 
But what you're seeing with MCU versus the comics is they're borrowing elements of the comics and they're munging them together and you're getting twists. Like the scrolls were the bad guys. Mm-hmm. You know, they were the ones that were coming in as shapeshifters to take over S.H.I.E.L.D. and the government and all that stuff. Well, it turns out they're the good guys now. Right. So they're creative in the way that they're trying to pull this stuff in. But I'll be curious to see, because that's too many shows for me to watch. Mm. I mean, that's, that's what, six shows right there you're looking at? Yeah, but also a lot of the, the Disney shows are only six to ten episodes. True. They're not, you know, you, we're not talking like a 20. They're really more like mini, you know, uh, mini series. That is true. Is really what they're, you know, and extended movies. I just you hope know. they don't ruin the characters right. by trying to delve too deeply in right. film. You, mm. Like, everyone kind of knows you're hinted at, at Nick Fury's background in the MCU. Right. You don't need to go into too much detail because if you do, then you're going to, like, you're going to ruin the character. Mm. I could see that. You know, it's too, too much to know. TMI. Sure. We'll go with that. Anyway. So that's, that's my rant for this show. I, you didn't give me enough on Star Wars to rant on Star Wars, so I had to Sorry. rant on something. Okay, that's fine. Um, what do we got next? So we have the best and the worst of the 2020 Emmys. Tell us about that. Um, so obviously with the pandemic going on, uh, a packed red carpet wasn't going to be happen. Uh, so no one really knew what to expect for the 72nd Primetime Emmy Awards, uh, what they were actually going to look like. Um, but it basically was a reflection of what the past six months are. People sequestered at their homes, interacting awkwardly over glitchy broadband connections. And, you know, it, it was it was interesting. I, I didn't watch the whole thing. I, I watched it here and there. Um, and it was interesting because some of the uh, people that were up for awards were dressed all in in ball gowns and looked glamorous and others were just like sitting in their living room in t-shirts and and jeans um you know so it was it was kind of interesting uh to see that they could kind of pull this off um what was funny was they kind of started out uh the show with you know Jimmy Kimmel doing this whole monologue thing and then they would you know show the audience and you saw like a full audience there and then you know kind of halfway through it they're going through something and you see jimmy kimmel's actually in the audience and obviously it you you realize that any shot that they were showing of the audience was pre-record you know it was you know previous years um uh from various different award shows that they were you know pulling together and as it turned out you know, they were basically in the Staples Center with not that many people around. They had a big setup with all these monitors so that whenever uh, they needed to go to live shots, you know, you basically saw, you know, everything on on the big screen. Uh, they did have a couple of people that went uh, that were with him uh, staying six feet apart doing, you know, the little banter and, you know, in some cases things did fall flat because you didn't get that reaction from an audience um but i think that's kind of the the problem most live shows are are having that would normally have a studio audience you're not getting that reaction when you say something uh you know funny or or that you're looking to get a reaction um but it was you know i think for what it was it, it was done you know it was done well um you know people are looking for a little bit of normalcy. Um, so those that, you know, are interested in award shows, um, you know, this, this didn't disappoint. Um, uh, some of the, the highlights obviously were that, um, in, um, they actually had a setup in Toronto for the whole cast and crew of Schitt's Creek, which swept, every comedy uh, award for writing, acting, directing, um, and they were all together in, in one room. So that was really kind of sweet to, to see their moments. Um, and then obviously, just like any award show, you know, there were the political uh, 
issues that got brought up and the subtle uh, statements, you know, that were made, which always happens during uh, any award show. But it was very subtle, nothing, you know, over the top. Um, All in all, um, you know, no real surprises for, you know, some of the awards. Unfortunately, Baby Yoda didn't get any more uh awards they they did uh, probably a good thing or else pedro pascal really would have quit then <laughs> yeah um but was was kind of cool was uh zendaya uh she actually won and she is now the youngest person to ever win uh an emmy she's 24 uh she's in a show uh euphoria um on hbo um and so here you have this, you know, Disney actress who's, you know, made it, you know, a, a, as a young adult. So that was kind of one of the the highlights of, of everything. Um, and then, you know, you had shows like The Watchmen, which it was one of the first shows, um, you know, based off of a comic book, you know, to win big. So that was kind of a uh, historic uh, as well. So all in all, you know, it was a, a a different type of award show, but very similar, you know, in in some respects as well. Well, and I think it's a sign of the times. I mean, you, mm-hmm. you kind of have to deal with the situation as it's handed to you here. Mm-hmm. And you make the most of it, right? Mm-hmm. I've never been a big fan of award shows. I, I think it's kind of silly to take actors who are multi-million dollar actors and pat them on the back for doing their job. So was never a big fan of it, but you know, it's, there's certainly a market out there for Mm -hmm. it. So kudos to them for keeping the tradition alive. Mm -hmm. And I think that was all we had for entertainment news. We'll be right back with our insightful picks of the week. Go for your insightful pick. So my insightful pick is a documentary um, called Down to Earth with Zac Efron. Um, So Down to Earth with Zac Efron is an American web documentary series that was released on Netflix this summer. And it stars Zac Efron and his friend uh, Darren Olin. And Darren is actually acting also as executive producer. Um, And what you find out is that, um, you know, he, he basically... Zach became friends with Darren. Uh, Darren is, you know, a, a health enthusiast and has written a couple of books. And it was one of those things that there, there was a book that kind of hit, um, Zach and, and really meant a lot to him. So he had reached out to him and that was actually how their, their friendship started. And they had decided, um, back in 2000 and, uh, 18 to kind of go on like this world tour and see these different areas um, and and see how, you know, they're dealing with various issues with climate control and and food production and and things like that, Um, how to, you know, sustainable living and and whatnot. And they travel from uh, France, Puerto Rico, London, Iceland, Costa Rica, Peru, uh, Sardinia. Um, And they just, you know, show like a healthy living, you know, and and just not only is it mentally, but it's the food that you eat and, you know, taking care of the environment and, and, you know, in Iceland, you know, how they harvest all of this, you know, energy. And, and it's just amazing when you think of how much is wasted and how much, you know, we don't take care of our planet here and everything that's being done in in other places to make a sustainable, you know, living, it's really kind of eye opening. And, and you hope that, you know, it inspires some people to, you know, to make the change to, to look at what you're putting in your body, what you're eating, you know, where is that food coming from? What pesticides, what's, what's being used, you know, what chemicals, you know, are, are you putting in and to just, be you know have a better lifestyle you know so it was it was very interesting um the one thing that was kind of sad was that when they had the wildfires in 2018 this is when they were doing uh the filming and darren's house actually was uh devastated in in the fire so it ends with him you know finally coming home and realizing you know he has nothing 
and he has to, you know, rebuild and, and redo and that, you know, we have to be better. We have to do something. And of course, now we have the wildfires going on yet again. So, you know, hopefully at some point someone will, you know, make some changes. But it was it was very interesting to see and and very thought provoking. Good pick. Thank you. I'm surprised you're you're doing documentaries again. So I've inspired you. I guess. Look at that. Awesome. We'll be right back. So my pick this week, back to my normal roots here, is a documentary. Oh, thank goodness. It is all in the fight for democracy on Amazon Prime. In anticipation of the 2020 presidential election, All In, the Fight for Democracy examines the often overlooked yet insidious issue of voter suppression in the United States. The film interweaves personal experiences with current activism and historical insight to expose a problem that has corrupted our democracy from the very beginning. With the perspective and expertise of Stacey Abrams, the former minority leader of the Georgia House of Representatives, the documentary offers an insider's look into laws and barriers that voting to voting that most people don't even know are a threat to the basic rights as citizens of the United States. This documentary... And I literally just watched, I started watching it last night and finished it this morning because I was going through Amazon Prime last night to find something decent to watch. Mm -hmm. This caught my eye. As you know, Sam and I had recently done a podcast on our Insights into Tomorrow show about voter suppression. And a lot of the things that we talked about there was touched, that they touched on in the uh, All In, The Fight for Democracy documentary and it really is a threat to our way of life to our government and we talked the documentary talks about very early on in uh, the history of our country where our constitution talks about we the people and we the people really were just white land holding men who had a right to vote it was it was less than 13% of the population was able to vote when this country started. And you had a lot of people who fought for this country, fought for the right to vote, and continue to fight. You know, they, they walk you through the Reconstruction period after the Civil War when laws were passed and we had uh, a much higher African American voting population and, and, candidates that were running and that was very quickly eroded and it it didn't come back until the voting rights act in the 1960s and the thing that struck me with this documentary and with the research that we did for our show is that it overwhelmingly seems to be one particular political party who insists on denying people the right to vote. And, of course, it's denial in the form of a claim to want to avoid voter fraud. But it is voter suppression nonetheless. And and politicians that don't want citizens to vote generally are not the kind of politicians that you want in office. And this was a very eye-opening documentary for me. Stacey Abrams had run for the governorship of Georgia in 2018 and lost by such an insignificant amount of votes to the point that it was within the margin of error of what a vote should be. The key is she was going up against who was at the time the Secretary of State of Georgia, who happened to be the person who was in charge of elections. Uh And somehow it was legal for him 
to compete in an election while still holding that role and not recuse himself of that. Hmm. So it's a very enlightening documentary to see the techniques and the tactics and the brutality in some cases of what voter suppression is. And I, I don't want to turn this into a political show or a political manifesto or anything. Um, but voting is important. Absolutely. Um, I have a employee at work who is in his mid thirties and has never voted. And I have had numerous discussions with him over the years trying to convince him of the value of the vote. And he always makes very poignant observations as to why he doesn't vote because he doesn't think his vote counts. And that's exactly what these politicians who impose voter What's suppression. That? Suppression. Thank you. These politicians that impose voter suppression, that's exactly what they want you to think, that your vote doesn't count. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, they're winning that battle with this particular person. Um, but we can't let them win that battle. You have a right to vote. If you did not have a right to vote, this would not be a democracy. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to tell anybody who to vote for or who not to vote for. Just vote. Get out there. Register. Vote. Be a part of the decision-making process. Mm -hmm. Whoever you think deserves to be in office, vote for who you think deserves to be in there, but don't sit on the sidelines. And this documentary was, was something that kind of hammered that home with me. So all in the fight for democracy, streaming now on Amazon Prime. And we'll be back. So I think that was all we had this week. Did you, did you have any closing remarks you wanted to offer? No, up? nothing today. Well, before we go, we do have some business to take care of since I kind of blew through it at the beginning of the show. Um, <laughs> uh, we invite you to check out our long form articles on medium at medium.com slash insights into things. I'm a little behind on those right now, so I'll, mm, I'll have a few slacker. more. Well, we haven't had too many hard-hitting topics that warranted a long-form article. No, I got it. But with the election coming up, I, th I think I can find a few topics to write about. <laughs> uh, I would also invite people to subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, and now Amazon. If you are subscribing, you can look for our video versions of the podcast under Insights into Things and our audio version. Under Insights and Entertainment, uh, you can reach out to us. Uh, we would encourage you to email us at comments at Insights into Things. On Twitter at Insights underscore Things. On Twitch, we stream six days a week at twitch.tv slash Insights into Things. On Facebook at facebook.com in, uh, backslash Insights into Things podcast. Uh, on Instagram now at www.instagram.com slash insights into things. All of our audio versions of our podcasts are at podcast.insightsintoentertainment.com. And high res versions of our video ver uh, episodes are available at YouTube at youtube.com slash insights into things. And if you need to get everything and anything you can go to our main website which is insights into things.com that's it another one in the book have a good week everyone bye bye